It's some little time since we've had uh, Western music on this program. And only a few weeks ago, when we were listening to a recording, we heard the voice of a young boy singing a few of the typical numbers of the outdoors, and finally we were amazed to find he was only 16. I know you good people listening in your homes tonight won't be able to see him, but I guarantee there'll be a gasp from our audience in the theatre here when I introduce him. 16-year-old yodeling boy, Frank Ifield. I remember you You're the one who made my dreams come true A few kisses ago Hi, I'm Jason Ford, and today on Verbatim, the man synonymous with this song, Frank Ifield. You're the one who said I, I love you too Yes, I do, didn't you know? I Remember You cracked the jackpot for Frank in 1962, earning him millions of fans around the world, most notably the late Queen Mother, who declared him her favourite performer. Frank's 50-year career can be summed up by the chorus of one of his songs. It takes a little bit of push, a little bit of shove, a little bit of luck, and a whole lot of love to make a dream come true. Today, Frank leads us through his heady journey to the top, from his 1937 birth to Australian parents in the English county of Coventry to Dural in northwestern Sydney and back again. I remember to a distant bell. My main memories of the wartime was that they were the saving grace as far as I was concerned because it got me out of schoolwork and I hated doing schoolwork anyway. And we used to go down into the air raid shelters and I remember that was the first time I ever got round to singing. And I think I was elected to be the singing leader purely and simply because I had a, a strong voice. It was as simple as that. But I, I felt that uh, you know, standing up in front and getting all the kids to sing gave me a sense of power, and I rather liked that. You know? So that was my beginning, I guess. Tell them I remember We had 89 acres of bush to run around in. My father bought a place out at Dural, and just growing up there in the bush gave me a lot of freedom and wonderful expression for, for you know, just, uh, uh, just living. And of course, um, walking around the bush, you know, I just loved to sing and sort of hear the echoes coming back at me from the, from the not the mountains, but from the rocks and what have you, you know. And I remember getting quite hooked on listening to uh, radio at that time and um, there was a program that used to come up from a place called 2KA from the Voice of the Mountains in the very early hours of the morning and I used to sneak in before going to school and have listened to this program and all the what they used to term hillbilly music was being played at that time and I got very hooked on listening to people uh, particularly like um, Elton Britt who had a, a wonderful yodel and a, a beautiful voice and it was one time when I was milking the cow, would you believe? And um, I suddenly found that I started to yodel and the cow calmed down because I never used to be able to get any milk out of this darn cow. It used to kick the bucket and everything, you know. So anyway, it calmed down. I thought, well, that's good. And I kept yodeling and, and I found I got more milk. I got more than a teaspoonful. <laughs> but what surprised me was the fact that I was, I was able to do it. And I rushed in into the kitchen and bailed my mum up. And I said, hey, listen to this. And I gave her this yodel. And she said, Mike. And then she said, I've always wanted to do that. And it seems like it's come out in you, you know. So it, obviously it was genetic somehow. I yodel out and high, let all my cares roll by. Just let my heart be light and free. Hold it, do, 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 and that's the way I'll always be. Surprisingly, my grandfather, uh, who I met uh, over here, um, I would be about nine or ten, very impressionable at that time. He, in fact, uh, used to be in show business himself at one stage, and he toured with Cobb and Co. coaches uh, with, a, with a company of the minstrels at that time, and he was um, uh, played the part of Mr. Interlocutor. And he would sing, and I'd listen to him sing, and in fact, I recorded quite a few of his songs there back then, and he gave me the sort of feeling, the wonderful feeling that, uh, he, to me, he was the personification of the bush pioneer, and uh, I learned a lot at his side, I can tell you. Who were some of your musical influences? Well, apart from Elton Brett, I would say that Tex Morton certainly was, uh, Hank Williams was very much so, and of course Slim Dusty was too. But there were a lot of influences uh, that I had at that point. Um, and of course we're talking about the early 50s here, 
uh, when I was sort of uh, trying to get on and, and, and do shows myself. And I remember I, I did quite a few amateur shows uh, around the place, amateur t- uh, contests. And uh, I remember I, I did quite a few at a place called Eden Park, which is out at, um, uh, it, it's out near a ride somewhere. And it was an open air concert. And I won that time and time and time again. I thought, hey, this is, this is getting really good, you know, and I'm really getting the bug. So I decided to, to really make a, a big jump this time. And I thought, I'll go and see uh, Tim McNamara, who was one of my idols at the time. And Tim was uh, probably one of the few country music artists at that time that could actually fill the, any place in the city. Um, I learned that he was up at Hornsby, which was very close to where I lived. And uh, I cycled up there one, one night to watch his show. And I thought, I'll get on his show if it's the last thing I did. And I, I got there before, while they were still rehearsing. And I, and I jumped up and I said, um, Tim, you know, I'd like you to hear me so I can go on the show. He didn't have any time because he was running the show. And uh, then I was put on to his brother, Tommy Mack, who was, in fact, the guy who used to do the comparing. And Tommy said, um, I'll never listen to what you've got to do, you know, and, and he listened. And he was rather impressed. And he said, well, hang around, he said, because if the moment it rises, we'll put you on. And as luck would have it, uh, the moment did arise because he announced a girl singer who was down in the dressing room and obviously he wasn't there ready to go on. And I'm sitting there with my guitar in hand waiting to get on. And so he announced me on and I went on there. I did... Um, two songs, and I looked off the side there, and there's Tim McNamara waving to me to get off, you know. And um, and I'm looking at the audience, and the audience is wanting more, so I'm, so I'm out there as long as I can, uh, you know, be there. And I remember I sang Golden Rocket, being nervous. I, was, I sang it so fast that uh, it, was, it was always a tongue twister at the best of times, and I don't think I understood a word I sang, but it didn't seem to make any difference. They were very much, you know, in my support. But at the end of the show, uh, I spoke with Tim McNamara and I said, well, you could see how well I went. I mean, you know, is there a chance of getting on his show? And he booked me. And uh, Tim uh, paid me one pound, one shilling, one guinea in those days. And I was with him for about four concerts. And I turned around to him and I said, look, I'll need some more money because I used to bring my mother and my brother and (laughs) everybody was there, you know, and because it used to cost a fortune to get in more than I made. So um, he sacked me on the spot. Uh, and there again, as luck would have it, his, he'd not long divorced uh, his wife, uh, Daphne McNamara, and Daphne was uh, setting up an opposition to him, running the Daphne, Daphne McNamara show, and she took a chance on me and headlined me on her show, and she gave me two guineas a show. So uh, that was, I was starting to happen. I've got spurs that jingle, jangle, jingle As I go riding merrily along I'd been working with Rick and Thel doing the, the amateur sh- shows and they were the professionals on and I asked them how do I get on the record and they said you've got to go and see a guy uh, called Alan Crawford who, uh, who runs Southern Music uh, Publishing Company and get some new material from him, they say. So I decided that I was going to you know, play hooky. I went there to see him and um, I bowled in unannounced and uh, I said to the girl behind the, the counter there, I said, uh, look, I'm here to see Alan and, uh, and that Rick and Thel had sent me to see him uh, apropos getting some new music. And he overheard the conversation, came out and he said, um, he said, who are you? And I said, my name is Frank Ifield, sir. And I said, uh, you know, Rick and Thel had uh, recommended you. And he said, look, I can't just sign anybody in just coming off the street. I don't know who you are or anything about you, you see, and you've got to be doing something like recording. So I told him a quick lie. I said, well, I am recording. And he said, who with? Now, that really put me on the spot. But I remember I was buying 78s, and they all had Regal Zonophone written on the top. So I said, I'm recording for Regal Zonophone. He says, oh, that's Mr. Ron Wills. He said, I'll check your story. And I thought, uh-oh. Anyway, he went to check the story. And then, of course, Ron Wills was out to lunch. Thank goodness for that. So um, he said, all right, I'll, I'll believe you. He said, I've got to dash out for lunch now myself. He said, but have a listen to the, the, uh, some records, but don't take them away. You just have to have a listen and let me know what you think of them. So I had a quick ear for music and I just played the song through and I, I listened to this particular song called Did You See My Daddy, Mr. Soldier? And I played it through and learned it very quickly. Then I got on the train and dashed down to EMI to catch Ron Wills before he came back from lunch. And I bailed him up the minute he arrived and I said, oh, Mr. Wills, I've been sent here by Alan Crawford to, to, to let you hear a song that he's just uh, you know, given me uh, with a view to recording. So 
And he looked very askance at me. And anyway, I, I took him into the uh, listening booth and I sang the song to him. And he said, yeah, I like what you do, son. He said, but uh, we just don't release anybody just off the top of you, you know, like this. You need to have some sort of major exposure. And so another lie came to me and I said, well, I am on Australia's Amateur Hour. And I thought, well, that'll, that'll knock him out because that's a big program that was listened to all over the country. And of course, I wasn't on on that show at all but I knew if I went to them and said I was recording I would get it and sure enough that's what happened then on the train home I thought how am I going to explain to my mum and my dad that I pulled off all these things but I should have been at school <laughs> well, Frank at the age of 16 you haven't had a great deal of time to make a presence felt in the entertainment world but you've certainly put a big dent in it already all of this affair, I spent most of my time in the city, mm. in the country rather, but yeah. uh, I came from England when I was about 10 years old. Oh, yeah. Well, just, just after the war. Well, where would you live in England? Uh? In, uh, in Coventry. Mm. You didn't happen to be there when the big blitz was on? No. Uh, oh, well, I was about two years old when we moved over to Birmingham, you see. That's, uh, we copped a bit, a bit of it there too, you know. <laughs> Did you? Oh, yes. Well, you look none the worse for wear, as I was going to say. Um, that's all gone now, so let's get on, I think, with some more of these good old outdoor songs, <laughs> eh? Going through the Sunset Valley With the snow-capped peaks above Yodeling a song, swinging right along Land of dreams I love I was doing, really, all the major radio stations throughout uh, Sydney at that stage. I was on them all, and I had my own programmers on them all. And of course, um, <clears throat> then the record was issued, and things started to happen for me, and I got several records out, and I was getting plays all over the country and getting known. Um, but what put a stop to that, of course, was the National Service. I was called in for that, and I thought, oh, that's my career down the drain, because somebody doesn't take long for somebody else to slip in your position. Um, but when I came out of the National Service, uh, luck was on my side again because they'd just opened television and I was given the first uh, television broadcast from uh, TCN Channel 9 um, and I had the first musical broadcast from there called um, uh, Campfire Favourites and that shot me back up there again and that's sort of, I was still doing all my radio programmes and everything else and doing shows around all over the country so that was uh, really I guess my biggest break. And this was around about 1957 I think at this stage and then I got my first hit ever. Uh, most people, a lot of people all over the world wouldn't, wouldn't remember this one, but I had my first hit in the early days of the charts from TUE at that time. Uh, where I had a song called True, and that sort of uh, clinched it for me. I turn to you with my every care Knowing you'll be there to endure and share Believe your arms and the warmth they bring. You're my everything. You're listening to Verbatim on ABC Radio National, and I'm Jason Ford. Well, it's now 1957, and while Frank Highfield is starting to make it here in Australia, England is where he really wants to be. Uh, I wanted to get to Britain before I turned 21. Now, don't ask me why, you know, but that was what I planned in my head that I was going to do. Um, and so, really, that, that dream it was materialising even back then. Uh, I met up with a guy called uh, Peter Gormley who uh, wanted to manage me. And uh, as strange as it may seem, the, one of his qualifications was that I must be prepared to go to England. And since I was going, to, wanted to go there anyhow, I thought, well, this uh, seems too good to be true. It's all locking into place. In fact, I wanted to work somewhere else other than Australia where they hadn't heard of me. And uh, we, I couldn't believe it because suddenly there's a booking came in for me to work uh, in, in uh, New Zealand, uh, covering a gummit of material from singing popular music to classical music and jazz and country and the lot. And I thought, well, that's wonderful experience. And so I went over there for that, uh, what they call the Festival of the Pines. And it was um, it was a great learning learning experience for me. So by the time I got back here to uh, Australia, it wasn't going to be too long before I went to Britain. And I'm waiting for Peter to, to let me know. And I've done probably about four or five farewell concerts on <laughs> on television. And it was getting to the embarrassing stage. I thought, well, if I don't make a move now, 
they'll think that I'm not going, you see, and it's all a con. So I, you know, I, I rang Peter up and I said, I'm coming. And he said, oh, you can't come now. And I said, yes, I am, I'm coming. And the reason that I did, I thought it was um, a very opportune moment for me to go over there on the, the inaugural Comet flight, which, uh, of course, uh, my father organised for me because he his uh, fuel pumps that he invented all those years before were fitted to that uh, uh, particular aeroplane. And uh, so I went on that uh, flight and I landed in, in London on the 5th of, uh, of uh, November, which of course is Guy Fawkes night. And I'd forgotten all about this, but I thought this is a welcome for me. I could see all these rockets going up all over the place. I thought, hey, I've made it. <laughs> and I went off in my sort of uh, stupor at that stage. You know what it's like after a long flight? I'm sure you do. And uh, it wasn't long after that, it was only just a matter of uh, perhaps a few weeks that I got uh, Ted Ray show uh, on television called Raise a Laugh. And I was, you know, I started on that and that gave me some television exposure. And from that, people began to recognize me in the streets because, you know, there was a popular BBC program. And in fact, I got onto the BBC, which you believe, without an audition, which was unheard of in those days. Um, and that developed from there. And I was getting a lot of television, particularly with the BBC at that time. Uh, and then, of course, uh, you know, the, the fact remained that I needed a hit. And of course, I wasn't even recording at that stage. And then I met up with Norrie Paramore. And Norrie had been well aware of the material that I'd done here in Australia. And he was very impressed with it. Uh, he just didn't quite know how to, to put me into a, a bag, as it were, and to, to bring the best out of me. And uh, we tried all kinds of things, and we came up with the first song was Lucky Devil, which made the bottom half of the charts. On the level, I'm a lucky devil to find a little angel like you. A sweet little angel like you. Now maybe I've got no pets for... It was very difficult when I first got over to Britain to find people who could play country music. Uh, I couldn't find the right sort of fiddle player or banjo player because what, what you'd, if you asked for a banjo player, you wouldn't get a banjo picker, you'd get one of these sort of people that trad jazz banjo, you know, or a fiddle player would be a violinist. It, you just, I just couldn't get the sound that I was after. But it was probably just as well because Nori Paramore was giving me a kind of lush sound behind me, which made my records very different from what I would have done. And in fact, when I was accepted over in the States, um, one of the things I think they accepted it for was that it was a, a different sound. It wasn't the sound that they were used to. It wasn't the musicians they were used to. It was different. It had some sort of uh, exotic flavor to it. My manager always said to me he didn't want me to yodel. And that kind of helped me up a little bit because there were certain things I wanted to do, little breaks and things I wanted to stick in. The, to me, they weren't gimmicks. They were part of the way of, uh, of my career. And what happened was I ended up at uh, Chester Royalty. It was the first time I'd, I'd topped the bill in Britain on my own accord. It was only a, a small theatre, but it was one of the... It was cocky and snoot at all the big ones, you know? So they stuck me on this bill. I remember the, the band being pretty awful. Uh, so I said, OK, play me on and, and uh, I'll get up there and I'll do the, most of the, sh the show with just my guitar. And one of the songs I sang, and, you know, at the end they called me back for more and I went out there and I thought, what am I going to do? And then one of the songs I remember singing was She Taught Me How to Yodel. And uh, the audience just went wild. And I thought, well, they love this yodeling, despite what uh, Peter Gormley was saying, you know, they like what I'm doing, you know. And I knew it would have a, a market. As luck would happen, it was not that long later on that I remember you happened. And when I got to uh, working at the, the, the Liverpool Empire, and um, I sang that, uh, she taught me yodel because the audience just demanded it. They'd all come over from Chester to hear me do it. So it's amazing how, you know, those things got around. And I think it was because of the success of that, uh, that song that, uh, that you know, they recognised something different in me that um, it was obviously poised ready for, for I Remember You when it happened because uh, I think that's what sort of kicked it off for me.
when I went up to Liverpool Empire, uh, a young man came round to see me. Um, and his name was Brian Epstein, and I'd never heard of Brian before, but um, he, he turned up to see me and he said, listen, he said, I want you to have to listen to this group that I'm recording. And I was in my dressing room at the time, and I had plenty of time before I went on. And so I said, OK. And they played the record of Love Me Do. And I said, oh, I like that. It's good. It's got all the sort of things in that I, that I like. It's got the harmonica, and it's got the ooh, and all that sort of business, which was near to what I was doing with the yodeling. Very, very similar sort of uh, country music type uh, atmosphere behind it. And I thought, yes, he's gonna, he's, they're going to be good. And he said, well, the reason I'm asking, he said, because the, the Beatles are not known outside of Liverpool and I'd like to put them on your touring show. And um, I said, I see no reason why you shouldn't, except that the, the, the show is already booked. Uh, so um, I got him to, to ring Arthur Howes, who is the guy who put the show on, and uh, to make sure that they, they could get, get on. And I gave them a good word. And that's what happened. They put them on uh, at Peterborough. Um, and he said, I'll put them on at Peterborough. They've got to do two shows. I'm not going to pay them a cent there. <laughs> um, but I want to see how they go. And uh, it wasn't very good, really, because the audience didn't like them. Oh, I like what they did. I've got to be honest with you. Um, I thought they were very good, but they, I don't think the audience were ready for them. But uh, it didn't take long before they were. And like the Beatles, Frank desperately wanted that one big hit. But time was running out. And we'd come to just about the end of the contract and we still hadn't had that biggie that I was looking for. I was doing lots of television, lots of you know, radio shows and things like that. And I was looking for, um, for a particular song. And I remember um, a song from back here in Australia called I Remember You, which was a jazz standard. And I'd been fiddling with this song for ages, trying to get it into the style that I wanted it. And it just, it just happened that I found the right style for it. And to me, it was a country style. And I changed a few of the chords and I stuck a yodel in it and things. And I remember singing that to Norrie and he said, well, we better have a hit because this is the last one in contract. Anyway, I sang him this song. He looked horrified at me. Um, and he said, uh, he remembered that song as a jazz classic. And he said, you've changed it too much. And he said, well, stick it down on tape what you're doing and I'll and mull it over. So he took it home and he rang me that very night. And he said, Frank, he said, I think we're onto something. That song's got the jingle of money. <laughs> and he was right too. We went to the recording studios and bang, that all happened. I remember you. You're the one who said I love you too. Yes, I do. Didn't you know? I remember too. I couldn't believe it. It jumped up so quickly, in fact, uh, into the number one slot that it just took my breath away, particularly since uh, you've got to take into consideration, uh, Jason, I went over to Britain not to make records so much as to, to play the theatre, and I gave myself a few years to crack it, and cracking it meant, it meant uh, playing the London Palladium. So it didn't really take that long uh, before uh, you know, my dream of playing the Palladium came true. It, 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 it came true exactly on the three years I'd set myself. So Frank finally reached the dizzying heights of pop stardom with his first major hit, I Remember You, spending seven weeks at the top of the British charts. Two more number one hits followed, Love Sick Blues and Wayward Wind, making Frank Ifield the first ever artist to have three consecutive number one hits in Britain. And the hits continued to roll. But in the early 1990s, Frank reached the lowest point of his life. Complications after a bout of pneumonia ended his singing career. He's now happily managing and promoting country artists. My life is through, and the angels ask me to recall the thrill of it all. Verbatim Today was produced by myself, Jason Ford, with assistance from Kirsty Melville. Technical production was by Judy Rapley. Thanks also to Jamie Kelly and Paul Hazel. 